Father, when we mention the name Jesus, the darkness does crumble. Father, fear is gone at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, Father, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. God, thank you that this church, we're here to celebrate the name of Jesus. Not just the name. Father, that he is our Savior, he is our King, he is our Lord. Father, we exalt him, we lift him up, we magnify him, we worship him. Father, everything that we do with our life, with our body, everything we do, Father, to glorify the name of Jesus. So, Father, thank you. Father, thank you through reminding us, through, the, for, through music, Father, and through words. Father, may that song reflect our heart and the wind, ones that we sung before. God, I pray over the rest of our service. Thank you for showing up in worship. And Father, I pray you'll show up now as we begin to transition to the speaking time. Father, a difficult top topic this morning, but a topic that we need to discuss. God, I love you. I praise you. Thank you for being my Savior. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. In April, I was introduced to that song at a conference that I was, uh, that I was attending. And uh, let me tell you something, Victoria, um, man, you can sing that song, okay? And, and I know you hate when I do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, well, let's see. Uh, well, they're pretty good. Okay, they're pretty good. So, you know, but yes, they do. They do justice to that song. So, hey, um, a lot going on in our church, and I would be negligent not to mention that um, not besides graduation weekend and um, first day for a lot of people to be out of school and vacations have begun, it is also Memorial Day weekend. And uh, we owe a great amount of gratitude to the families who have had loved ones who have paid the ultimate price um, so that really we can be here today to worship, um, to lift up the name of Jesus. And so uh, take an opportunity this weekend, besides all your time off that you may or may not be getting and uh, the barbecues and families and graduations and all the different family events, take a time to remember what Memorial Day weekend is all about. And thank God for the families um, who've had their loved ones pay the ultimate price. Father, thank you again for Memorial Day weekend. One time a year, Lord, is not enough to say thank you uh, for those who have paid the ultimate price, Father, from the very first battles, um, from even the ones that are of recent. Many men and women have given their life um, so that we could have the privilege to be here today, to live in a free country. Uh, God, thank you. Uh, there is no greater love than a man be willing to lay down his life for another. And so thank you for the men and women uh, who have done that, that have gone on before us. Lord, the only thing I can pray is minister to the families that are left behind. Um, surround them with your love. God, we as a church say thank you in honor of them. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're at a busy time at Oasis Church. I don't know whether you guys are watching your bolts, and I hope you do. Uh, we're getting up into the camp seasons. We have family camp coming up, and before you know it, we're going to have youth camp and, and children's camp. And I want to say thank you to the church. Uh, you guys did a marvelous and, and, and so generous. I think we provided a little bit over $4,000 in our three offerings for camp. Uh, so thank you so much for helping boys and girls go to camp. It is so important um, because Jesus is taught at those camps. It's an opportunity for them to pray, to receive Christ, and have a, I like to call it a mountaintop experience for a week, um, to get away from Yuma, to go somewhere where it's a little bit cooler, um, and just have the time of their life, um, again, celebrating around people who are like-minded and having some just good old-fashioned fun. I think that's really important um, to have some fun and hear about who Jesus is. So thank you, church, um, for ministering in that way. The last thing I want to talk to you about, well, actually, there's two things. We are about to start next week, June 3rd, believe it or not. June will be here already, and we are going to start what we call our Summer of Missions. It's a 60-day campaign to support Arizona Baptist Children's Services, and there are so many different things that we're doing uh, we're going to start showing some videos next week and highlighting some different areas. But remember, I'm asking the church to do two things. If you weren't here last week, 
One is to take a baby bottle. Now, you can take a preemptive strike, okay? You can take a baby bottle home this week if you choose to, but the actual campaign starts next week, and I'm going to be asking you to bring those baby bottles back, and this is what we're going to do. Probably during the welcome or something of that nature, we're going to put a couple of these five-gallon water dispensers out here because our goal is to fill up two of them in 60 days, okay? And, and so I went into my office, and because we're not going to the Dominican Republic this year, um, I save my change all throughout the year. Um, and believe it or not, my change is enough to pay for my deposit um, to go to the Dominican Republic. And so I filled up two baby bottles um, just with the change that was in my blue piggy bank um, coming in from getting a soda or whatever of that nature. I just put the change in there, and when it's DR time, I cash it in, and lo and behold, it's my deposit. But this year, it's going to um, going to go to a new life. And so what we'll do is we'll take these baby bottles, we'll probably put them out in their foyer, and we'll just dump them in until we have two of them that are full. Now, this is for you as adults. Our children's department, don't be surprised today that some of them might come home with some baby bottles. And in the youth on Wednesday nights, they're also be coming home with baby bottles to be able to do that. And the second thing we're doing is we're doing food boxes. Um, And next week's item that we would like you to pick up is some type of pasta. I I picked spaghetti, okay, because I like spaghetti, all right, And, and some type of sauce to go with it. Because believe it or not, that's a meal, okay? This is a meal for someone who doesn't have um, something to eat. And so these food boxes are, are great. And these are the items for next week. I'll put these on our website. You'll be able to see them and remember in some type of pasta and some type of pasta sauce. And we can bring those in. Our goal as a church is to provide 300 food boxes, okay, throughout the summer. And so, again, we have lots of goals that we're doing. Many other activities in our days of summer Um, So again, I hope that you're praying about that, actively wanting to be participating and involved. Our church council and our elders felt it was important that whatever we did this year, it had a personal um, touch to it, It, that it wasn't just going out and painting park benches or or picking up trash, and those are well-needed things in our city. They are. But there's nothing like being personal about helping somebody with a need in their life. And so this is why every activity we're doing, whether it's through foster care or parent aid or, again, um, whether it is talking about um, providing uh, food for uh, people who don't have it, those are all personal touches. And hopefully um, you're going to help me and get involved in that as we progress through that through the summer. Remember, we are in week two of our prayer um, we're asking God to pray for 30 days um, about uh, what, again, I announced last week, us um, joining the two congregations together, Ecclesia Church and Oasis Church, coming back together um, for them to do what they do in our church and for us to do what we do in our church to help them out, a merging of what I call DNA. Okay, they do some things very well that I wish we did better. We do some things very well that they wish that they did better. And to unite the two churches together to make a bigger impact for the community in which we live. I've asked you to pray. That's all I'm asking you to do for the next 30 days through about mid-June to pray and ask if God is in this. We think as a leadership team we have the answer. This is your part in the process. Would you pray? Would you join us in praying um, over the next 30 days about that prayer request? Now, this morning, we're going to kick off back in our series in 1 Corinthians, and we come to chapter 7, and chapter 7, I told you, is a difficult chapter. There is no easy subject to preach on in chapter 7. This is a hard-hitting letter that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, trying to correct some deficiencies that were within the church, and, and the issue that I have with this is this church at Corinth is really messed up. Okay, it is definitely the church gone wild. And what I breaks my heart is what I see at the church of Corinth isn't much different today in the United States of America in the churches in which we attend on Sunday. So the issues that Paul is talking about are the same issues that I believe are very, very prevalent in today's church. And they're hard heading. Okay, they are hard hitting. And Paul, um, he doesn't he, he really just doesn't mince any words. And some of the things that we're talking about today are going to be difficult. But did I tell you that I believe God's word? I do. I believe God's word. 
I believe it is the inerrant word of God. And what I mean by that is there are no mistakes in it. It is totally 100% inspired by the Holy Spirit. Did I ever tell you that sometimes I struggle with God's word? Sometimes I might even tell you that as a pastor um, who spent a lot of my life now studying God's word, there are parts of it I don't like. There are parts of it that humanly I disagree with. But did I ever tell you that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? And what that means is I follow his teachings regardless of whether I like it or whether I even agree with it. God's word is challenging. Look at some of the topics we've talked about. We've talked about incest inside of the church. We talked about that. We talked about sex and we talked about, uh, again, what God's plan is and what was happening at the church of Corinth. And we were challenged by God's word. And this morning will be no different. Matter of fact, this topic of this morning is a topic of divorce. And I know some of you just said, oh, great. Where's my phone? Okay. I can play solitaire at least. Some of you are thinking, Pastor, Pastor, could we please talk about tithing instead? Uh, this would be a great weekend to talk about tithing. Please don't let us talk about divorce. It's in the scripture. And if we were to avoid topics like this, then we would not be doing justice of saying that we're a church that teaches God's word. Okay, and that's important to me. So there are going to be things that are going to challenge us. There are going to be things that we've fallen short in. There are going to be things that we're not going to like. But it doesn't change the fact that it's God's word. And it doesn't change the fact that we're held accountable for God's word in our life. It doesn't change that. Now, I want to remind you, Paul's not writing this to unbelievers. Paul's not addressing this subject with people who are not followers of Christ. Even though, I will tell you this, whether they believe it or not, they're held to the same standard as we are, but they're not Christian. And therefore, they're not going to listen to this. But Paul is addressing to us, those of us that are Christians. So we're going to look at this topic, and we're going to try to use it with a little bit of grace, and we're going to try to look at it with a little bit of compassion, but we're also going to look at it with a lot of truth. And we're going to see what God's Word says, because a lot of us, I'm going to tell you this, and I hate to say this, we have this fairy tale um, picture of marriage, don't we? I think maybe it was too much, I think it was probably too many Walt Disney movies when we were younger, Okay. Because all the time in the Disney movie, um, Prince Charming, Mary, and they lived what? Hey, you watched the same movies I did, okay? I mean, Ariel marries Eric in the end, and they go off and they have little mermaids, okay, between the two of them. I don't know, but it is. It, it's, I got to tell you, we think that marriage, and when it ha- it's going to be just blissful. And guys, it's not. Matter of fact, if I was to talk to any couple sitting in here this morning, any couple sitting in here, it's hard work. It takes a lot of work to take two independent people. And I know some of you. Some of you are very independent. And some of you want your way. I'm not one of them. But uh, anyway. Hey, you keep yourself in mind, okay? Don't worry about me, okay? But anyway, you know, we're two independent people with two different wills and two different backgrounds. and, and, And you're bringing them together, as God said, as one flesh. To become one flesh spiritually, emotionally, and physically as husband and wife joined together. And it's hard work. You know, they were tell- I, w- I was talking about that, you know, and, and, and you know, nine out of ten of us, we're going to get married, by the way, okay? And that's just statistics again. And a, and a great unfortunate thing that happens, and it happens even within the church, many of those nine out of ten will end up in divorce matter of fact i'm going to say that we have i know this will shock you but we have people who've been divorced in our church we have people that are right now sitting in our church contemplating divorce we've had people who are hurting because of divorce and i'm trying to keep that in mind as we go through this passage today in 1957 there was only one state in the united states of america that had what we call a no-fault divorce. You know what that means, right? 
that you could go and get you could get divorced and you didn't have to have a reason. Prior to 1957, though, it, somebody had to be at fault. Okay, somebody was going to be blamed, um, and in that one state, okay, had a no fault. In other words, you could just go up there and say we don't like each other anymore, and you could get divorced. And that was, there was really no question about it. They would sign the paperwork. Sometimes you have to wait the prescri- prescribed time, but you would be divorced. And, and but in 1970 there became a movement in the United States of these no-fault divorces and the the, the movement began and in 1995 now remember 1957 there was only one state in 1995 all 50 states now have what we call no-fault divorces in other words you can just go up to the clerk of the court and say I want to get divorced file for a divorce and whatever time later you can be divorced you don't have to prove you don't have to you just say i don't want to be married to that person anymore and of course we've seen divorce rates um climb higher and higher and higher matter of fact our society um today is a product probably more than likely of families that come from being divorced that are raising children um who are being divorced and it just keeps spinning Um, completely out and a lot of times I will say that we kind of ignore what God has to say about this and I understand I I get it I may not agree with it but I get it because doesn't God really just want me to be happy God you know we we got together and all of a sudden it's not working out doesn't God just want me to he does want you to be happy but he wants you to be happy in him in accordance with his will in accordance with um, his plan So we're going to tackle it this morning. We're going to look at it from a three kind of pronged attack, if you want to call it. We're going to see what God the Father has to say about it. We're going to see what Jesus had to say about it. And then we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul was writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through um, 16. So are you excited this morning as I am? You know, when I come to these kind of Sundays, I sweat a lot, okay? Um, Because I know that this passage... And these passages and this topic, this is difficult for some people. It is. It's hard. And I know that there are people that are hurting and there are people that are struggling with this. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and get going in this. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 2. We're going to look at Malachi, and uh, somebody's going to say, yes, he is going to talk about tithing. Um, but for those of you who um, know, we're, there's another part of the Malachi that a lot of us tend to forget. So we're going to look at this from starting in verse 13 of chapter 2. It says, this is another thing you do. The, the whole context behind chapter 2 is they're bringing up um, family sin, sins that are happening within the family. And, and the writer that says, here's just one more thing I have. Um, and the, the writer of this would be God, by the way. You, it says, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. And yet you say, for what reason? A, a, a man or, brings an offering before God and, and, and God says, now, you know, we talk a lot about money, but God says, I reject that offering. And the man asks, why? Why are you rejecting the offering um, that I'm bringing to you? And, and I'm glad that God answers the question. Here he goes. He says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Would you just mentally, or you could if you wanted to, um, use your pen and circle that word in your mind or in your Bible covenant? We're going to come back to that in just a second. But not the one uh, has. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. And now I put this in big red letters, for I hate divorce. Who said that, by the way? Look at the next part. Says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now. I wanted, to, I wanted to take you here because I wanted you to see what God's position is on this subject. 
This is one of those things. Matter of fact, if you turn in your Bible and it says there are a few things that God hates. Matter of fact, there's six things that God hates. One is a complete abomination to him, but one of them happens to be divorce. And so shouldn't that be just, shouldn't that be a warning shot across the bow to those of us that are Christians? This is something that God takes very, very seriously. So I'm one of those that likes to ask questions. I do. I ask questions. And one of the things I asked is, why does God hate divorce? Why? If, if, if this is his opinion, why, uh, if this is his, and I want to be careful about using words opinion and advice because this is his instruction, by the way. If this is his instruction that I hate divorce, why? I want you to listen to this guy because he says it better than I can, and I have no problem giving credit where credit is due. Um, listen to this guy because he talks about why God hates divorce. Why does God hate divorce? The Bible says that, that God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorced people. He doesn't hate it when a person files for a divorce if, if they have a good biblical reason, but he hates it when divorce happens. The book of Malachi gives us the answer to that question. Malachi 2.16 says, The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. So why does God hate divorce? Because it starts with hate. Now That might seem strong. Maybe you know someone who's been divorced and they, they never hated their spouse. But, but think about this. In the Bible, to love someone means to do what's best for them. No matter how they're treating you, no matter how they're serving you, if they are serving you at all, it's to do what's best. That's love. Therefore, hate is to not do what's best. You don't have to spew vile words. When, when you stop trying, when you stop submitting, when you stop serving, that's hate. And that does violence to the marriage vows. So often when we try to figure out divorce in the church, we have to ask the question, not just who filed for a divorce, but who decided to hate? Who stopped loving? Who, who turned to friends before their spouse? Who turned to alcohol before their spouse? Who turned to flirting, to cheating, to violence, to domestic abuse before their spouse? That's the stuff that God hates because it leads to a place that he hates. One flesh being ripped into two. That's the truth. I know it's hard to hear. Divorce doesn't happen without hate. Without one person or, or two people who give up on trying to do what's best for one another. But let me remind you that our God is also full of grace. He is full of undeserved love. He's full of, of crazy compassion. And, and so maybe you've been hated. Maybe someone hasn't done what's best for you. I want you to know today that, that God, no matter what happened with your marriage, he loves. And even if you were the hater, even if for the first time now the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to the sins you committed, God is so full of grace, it reaches down even to you. On the cross, Jesus cried out, It is finished. And he thought about sins just like that, just like yours, just like mine. So let's go back to those vows. Let's make a commitment to love. Let's ask God's grace to fill up our hearts that we can do what's best no matter what they give in return. That's what God loves and that's why God hates divorce. In our you know, I believe, first of all, marriage is given to us by God. I believe that was part of his plan. I believe that he said, and he's given us a great and wonderful gift. And, and I've said this before, that I think that sometimes every gift that God gives us, every gift that God gives us, we, the Satan, the world, has a tendency to turn to bad. And, and, and today, in our day and age, so many of us have what I call a, a Velcro approach towards marriage. If something goes wrong, if something goes bad in the relationship, it's okay because I'll just take the Velcro off and move to someone else. That attitude very much cheapens what God gave us for marriage. See, I see marriage as a little bit different. I see when the husband and wife get married, they become one flesh, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And when you try to separate what God has given us, it's not Velcro. It's not. 
Because see, Velcro, I can just move from one thing to another thing and attach myself, and there's really no harm or no foul. But see, I believe that what a husband and wife are to be glued together. I do. That. I believe that they're to be glued together for until death do us part. And so I thought about that, and when I started thinking about that, you know, if you want to get divorced when you do this, and it breaks my heart when I do this because I've seen this happen. And what's unfortunate about this is this person is going to go attach herself to someone else. And we wonder about the hurt and what it does to the family. And, and I've heard people say, I have, oh, my divorce was nothing. It was easy. It was just a, it, we, we're still friends today. You do not understand the damage that you have done to one or another, even possibly to the kids if they were in the relationship. This is why God hates divorce because of what it does to us as individuals and some of you are living testimonies see i believe a big god i'm gonna tell you that i I believe in a god that changes people i do i'm sorry i believe in a god that can you know uh, uh, us christians we're always looking for loopholes we're always looking for reasons to to get out of the covenant that we made oh that is true right because malachi said that our relationship is a covenant before god it is a promise uh, and, and, uh, you know in arizona you guys probably know this but in the state of arizona when you go to get your marriage license you have two options you can get a standard marriage license or you can get a covenant marriage license They cost the same thing, by the way. They're both $83, and and you can get one, but the covenant requires you to do premarital counseling, and a covenant marriage requires you to do um, some type of pastoral, spiritual um, marriage counseling prior to being able to be divorced because it's a covenant. And I think that we forget this because I've done lots of weddings and I've done some beautiful weddings um, where the bride and groom just look fantastic. And we got a matron of honor and, and, a, and a groomsman and the, all, they all look fantastic and, and they're pretty and everything's up there. And their moms and dads and grandmas or grandpas are here. And the vows that they share, they're exciting. It's new. It's fresh. I, I, I love it, but they forget the most important witness to their marriage. God Almighty. God Almighty witnesses and testifies to that. And I'm so glad that our God is not a God of contracts. Where he could break the contract. He's a God of covenant. There are several covenants that are in the Bible from the Old Testament, even through the New Testament, that he establishes with his people. Promises that he makes and he fulfilled every single one of them. And that's how God views our marriage together, as a covenant. I told you I believe in a big God, right? That changes people. I try to be transparent. I really do. And sometimes my wife and I um, are the subject of a lot of our discussions here from the front. And, you know, I'm going to be just just gutfully honest with you. I married my wife back in 1985 in June um, up at Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to have our 33rd wedding anniversary next month. And what's really cool about that is we're still together um, because I'm going to tell you, um, our first six years, ooh, they were rough. They were tough, okay? Um, I got to say that I was doing my thing and she was doing hers. See, because nobody ever told me how to be married, by the way, okay? They, they, I did some premarital counseling. They said, yeah, it's going to be hard work. You're going to have to work hard at it. But nobody told me it was going to be that hard. And I got to say, you know, it, uh, the first six years, we, we had a horrible marriage compared to what we have today. And I'll be honest with you, neither one of us was liking it too much. Now, I can't speak for my wife because she's not speaking this morning, but I can speak for myself. There were thoughts. There were thoughts of 
ending the marriage. Even though we promised the people that are premarital counseling that we would never bring up the topic of divorce because once it's brought up, it usually never gets um, unbrought up. And we struggled. And then it was amazing. I, I don't know what it is about God. And, and see, I got to tell you, we were both Christians at the time. And I, was, I, I have been actively serving Jesus um, even before I got married. And I know what God's word says about divorce, and I understand um, what it says. And, and I, uh, you know, that was another pressure that I was feeling all by myself because I was already, believe it or not, back then teaching and um, doing all kinds of different things inside the church. And my wife and I, we were not happily married. And I was actually considering, let's just get divorced because God wants me to be happy. And I remember sitting there, and I remember this as if it was yesterday. I can tell you the exact place where I was sitting. I had a really long discussion. After my wife came up to me and she says, I don't like you. And I couldn't blame her because, again, I, can I say this in church? I was a butthead. Now, I'm still a butthead today, but not as a big a butthead. This was year six. This was after my daughter had been born. And we were contemplating not going farther as husband and wife. And I remember talking with God and yelling at God, Lord, change her. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Change her because she was, it's her fault, God. Oh, how quickly God teaches us. How quickly God reminded me, you don't worry about her. I'm her God. I'm worried about you. And I was, that came right, that, God was speaking directly to my heart. He says, I'm going to change you, Bob. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Year seven was a little better. Year eight was a tiny bit better. Year nine we were starting to get better. We're at year 33, and we're getting a little better. We never gave up. But I'm sitting here this morning, and I want to be real careful by saying that because I know that there are people in this church who prayed the exact same prayer. And it didn't work for you. You prayed to Almighty God. You prayed to, the, the, to, the, to, to, to your Heavenly Father. You anguished on your face before God. You were on your knees day and night praying for yourself and the marriage. And yet it still ended. And there's only one thing I can say. I am sorry. Because I will never know why God answered my prayer request. By his grace. By his grace. And I am sorry that it did not work out for you. Because I know that there are men and women in this church who agonized. And it didn't work. And I am sorry. In my younger days, I know some of you didn't know me in my younger days. But I was so harsh on people. So judgmental. And I've always said, especially now that I'm into my, we'll just call middle 50s. I am so grateful for God's grace because I've always said you never can ever give someone grace until you've experienced grace. I'm still for God's truth, but I'm a whole lot more compassionate. And can I just say empathetic? I may not agree with you, 
Because I'm still going to stick with what God's word says. Because we all should stick with what God's word says. So what does it say? And you're saying, Bob, is this guy going to be a two-hour message? Yes, okay. Hey, by the way, just so uh, I'm giving you, you know, I was talking with Cheryl about this. Back in the day, we spent six months, six months morning message and evening message back then when we actually did church in the morning and evening. You were doubly blessed back then on the topic of divorce. Six months looking at every single scripture verse about this topic. There's a lot. Paul, when he begins his teaching, he quotes Jesus, by the way. Look at what he says here. Married, let the married, I give instruction, not I, but the Lord. This is a, a, a if you want to talk about it, a, a retelling of what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19. And you know how those end, right? What God has joined together, let no man separate. That was, the, that was the culmination of what Jesus taught in Mark 10 in Matthew 19. And, and Paul, really what he's doing is he's just repeating what Jesus said. He, he says, look, the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. This is what Jesus is t- taught, and, and, and Paul is retelling this in, in, in those first two verses. Look, he says, look, and I can't, I, I can't tell you exactly what's going on in the church of Corinth. There's a lot of um, tradition, a lot of history that the, the church was started, and, and many women were coming to know Christ. And many of the husbands were not. As a matter of fact, they were staying in that lascivious lifestyle. They were probably more interested in the temple priestesses, the prostitutes, than they were in their wife. And the wives must have somehow asked Paul, is it okay if we just separate, get divorced? And look what he says. The wife should not leave her husband. And we're not talking, the word leave is divorce. It's not a separation. They didn't do separation back then. And, and I want to say this, especially before I get into the heart of this teaching, look, I get asked question, Pastor, what about an abusive situation? What about violence in the home? What about he or she is beating on the kids? What about, what about, look, God never intended marriage to be that way. And I will tell you this, if your home is not safe, get out and get help and pray like you've ever prayed that that person will change the behavior within the home because you are not to be beat on. Your kids are not to be beat on. And I'm not talking about husbands. I'm talking about husbands and wives. And there should be safe boundaries. That was not the way a marriage was supposed to be. So don't be in that situation as long as that's taking place. And you have your pastors, not that you care, blessing to, to remove yourself, put a boundary in place if the home is not safe. But I'm not talking about that this morning. I'm just talking about they don't get along. And that's the primary reason most people get divorced today. They just don't get along. Here's the tough teaching. The the disciples didn't even like this teaching. They cringed and said, this is a hard statement. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried. See, and that's a difficult one because we're talking about the previous verses, Paul talking about our sex drive and was talking about, you know, if you can't, you control yourself, then you, um, it's better to marry than it is to burn but God says she's to remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And husbands, let me tell you something. You should not divorce your wife. Isn't that an amazing passage right there? Don't overlook that. Husbands, you should not divorce your wife. You know why? Because husbands, you're the spiritual leader in the home. Paul's not writing this to unchristians. He's writing this to Christians. Paul is writing to the man saying, don't do it. That is a horrible spiritual example. Don't do it. And then Paul goes on in his teaching. And he covers something. Watch how he starts verse 12, because this is interesting to me. But to the rest, I say, not the Lord, okay? Oh, wait a second. You say, 
who's speaking here? Not to, Paul's speaking. He says, I'm going to speak to you, not the Lord, that if, a, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. It's interesting. Paul now is going to give his, and, and, and please remember this. He's backed up what Jesus said, and now he talks about a topic of inside of divorce that you've probably brought up before um, that Jesus or God did not address. And he, what he brings up in this passage is, is, what if I marry someone who's not a believer? Can I get divorced from somebody who's not a believer? This is what Paul's talking about here. This is this whole passage. Can I get divorced if I'm... Well, I got news for you. The answer is no, you cannot. And here's why, because Paul told you that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I believe um, the Holy Spirit to be an active part of the Godhead, that you weren't supposed to marry in the first place. See, the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked. But I know, I, you know, I'm looking at young Samuel, and I've known Samuel since he was about this high, and lots of his friends graduated this weekend. You know, when you're about Samuel's age, and, you know, the only thing that Samuel's thinking about now is school. Good, Samuel. I respect that a lot, okay? Um, but there's going to be a day that the switch is going to flip, and you're going to be thinking about getting a girlfriend, and then Mrs. Wright is going to walk into your life, and, and everything is going to go like unicorns and rainbows, and, and, and all logical thinking, Samuel, is going to go out the window because you're in what? Love. And I'm going to tell you this, when you're in love, you don't care what God's Word says because God must have brought that person into my life, right? Wrong. Not if they're not a believer. I know some of you are going to say this. Well, what about this, Pastor? We were both unbelievers when we got married. We were both naive, okay? We didn't know anything about Jesus. I went to a Billy Graham crusade. They were singing just as I am. I went forward and I gave my heart and life. And from that moment, I've been a Christian and I am walking with Jesus. Can't I get out of this relationship now? No. You cannot. Because the word teaches that you might be the very instrument, a tool that your husband and or your wife might come to know Christ through. So you cannot get out of that relationship. And then there's this verse in chapter 15. And I, where does my time go? Um, chapter 15, or I'm sorry, verse 15. Here's the escape clause. We're always looking for good escape clause says, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. Here's the escape clause. If you're married and you're a believer and the unbeliever decides to leave you because of whatever reason, they're free to go. And they're free to divorce. You're not free to divorce. They're free to divorce you. And I know we have people in our church who find themselves in that situation now. I've read the connection cards. I know how some of you are earnestly praying um, that your unbelieving spouse would come to know who Jesus is. Keep on praying. I thought about some things and um, I, I, just really quickly because, man, Lord, where did the time go? You're going, I'm glad it's gone. I'm going, it's not done yet, though. If you're married to an unbeliever in your home, let me give you a couple of do's. Do. Be patient. Be tolerant. Do live a life of love. Do submit to their leadership. Do love them like Christ loved the church. And then there's a couple don'ts. Don't nag them. Don't drive religion down their throat. Don't make them miserable about not coming to church. Don't make them pay for your relationship with Jesus. Can I say this also? Don't expect them to walk in the same manner in which you walk. They're not believers yet.
I promise I am not going to make this too long. And nor will I continue this next Sunday. Here's some things I took from the passage. Worship team, you can come up and that will help me speed myself up. Would you ask yourself a question? Do you agree with God? This is a tough one, right? This message, you were wishing I did talk about tithing or anything else other than this. Would you ask yourself, do I agree with what God's word says? Now, I didn't give you thoughts and opinions this morning. I have lots of thoughts and opinions. And some of them, you know, are my personal conviction of where I stand on the scripture. But I tried not to do that with you this morning. We just looked at what the scripture said. Do you, do you agree with that today? Secondly, I'm thinking about this. The hard work of choosing the right spouse can save a lot of hurt on the back end. Um, I was talking about this with a couple this morning, and we were, we were discussing this. You know what I'm, this means is, you know, if I was a youth pastor, oh, I, I, one, I wouldn't be, okay? Um, but if I was a, a youth pastor, I would be encouraging the youth in my youth group to make a list of the qualities of what you want in a prospective spouse. I would be encouraging you to do that. And then I would tell you this one piece of advice. Don't stray from that. Do the hard work on the front end, and it will save you a lot of painful, hurtful work on the back end. Because I will tell you, once rainbows and unicorns come up, nobody can tell you anything. That's why as a pastor, premarital counseling may be I hate to say this because I, I, I keep changing my thoughts and opinion. It may be the biggest waste of time um, because couples come to you and in love and you can't tell them anything. Oh, he's wonderful. She's my Ariel. Or is she your Ursula? I don't know. And if you don't know who they are, you need to watch more Disney. My current marriage is a covenant before the most important witness. You realize that, right? The most important witness, God himself. What does it say? Just like anything valuable, your marriage requires constant attention and, mari- uh, and maintenance. Guys, this is not just dinner once a year on the anniversary. This is constant attention. I'm going to tell you something. My wife is the most valuable asset I have earthly. She is. Now, I just bought a bass boat. I love my bass boat. I love spending time out there, but it doesn't compare to what I think about my wife. Do I get a kiss later? Look, if your marriage isn't where it should be, then my relationship with Jesus is not where it's supposed to be. Read that one more time. If my marriage is not where it should be, then my relationship with Jesus is not where it's supposed to be. I've heard husbands and wives tell me this. Oh, well, me and Jesus, we're fine. It's just her or him. No, it's not. And both should be your biggest priority. Let me say something. Our marriages that we have, I don't care whether you're in your fifth marriage today, um, be married to that person. If you're in your first marriage today, be married to that person. And it is the most important relationship you have this side of heaven. It's more important than your job. It's more important. And can I say this and probably get in trouble for it? It's more important than your offspring that you brought into the world. It's more important um, than your hobbies. It's more important than anything else other than the name in which we sung about earlier, Jesus. Your marriage is more important than the church. Your marriage is more important than your ministry. There is nothing more important than the person that's sitting right next to you. If my spouse is not a believer, I will pray as if their life depends upon it. Can I just say this? It does. If I've been divorced, I'm not a second-class citizen to God. 
I'm not second class in his kingdom, and I'm not second class in his work. And let me apologize for every other church or every other pastor or every other person in your life that has ever made you feel like you are less than because you've been divorced. You are a joint heir with Christ. You are a child of the king. He has called you and has a purpose for you and has ministry for you. And God bless you. And forgive those churches um, that disqualify and say that you're less than because you made a mistake. Well, God help all of us because every single one of us has made a mistake. And when is it that we all of a sudden elevated this sin above any other sin? Why? It's a sin. It is not the sin. And if you're sitting here today and you're saying, you know what, pastor, you just don't know my circumstances, I don't. But I'm going to ask you to do something. If you're sitting here and you're contemplating, thinking about getting divorced, let me encourage you at this very minute to ask God to open your heart to what he has to say. And if we're here today as a follower of Christ, that should be really, really important to us. The last thing I say to the church Divorce is one sin. It is not the sin. We as God's people need to respond in a Christian way to those who have to go through this unfortunate journey. Be Jesus. I'm not going to do the next steps today. I think they're on the card. I think they're self-explanatory. I want to pray. Jeff, I appreciate your presence with us over the last few years. I know this is your last Sunday and you are heading back to Michigan. Is that correct? Michigan has four seasons. You'll have to get used to them all over again. Um, But I appreciate you. You have been very faithful to our church. You have been faithful to the boys and girls at San Luis High School. Um, I appreciate your being a teacher and attempting to model to the young people of our world what it is to be a follower of Christ. So Jeff, it saddens me that you're leaving, but it saddens me that you're getting to get to go home um, and go to the next chapter of your life. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, oh gosh. Thank you for your word even the hard ones. Father, I thank you that we're not a church that shrinks away from your word just because it's hard or because it's difficult. Lord, help us to be able to process this in a way. Lord, help us to remember, especially, Lord, my heart just breaks for people today who are sitting there and for some reason or another, they're feeling guilt or they're feeling condemnation. Lord, would you just remind them gently in your word that there is no guilt or condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, if I in any way have gotten in the way of that and and heaped upon guilt or heaped upon condemnation, that was not my intention, Lord. My intention is to faithfully teach your word. Father, this is a huge area in today's day and life. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts and our minds. God, it is, again, in that name of Jesus that we pray. At his name, the darkness will tremble. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen.